welcome to That Business Show 2.0 with your host, Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business. Today, we're going to talk about how to handle those arguments and how to handle those uh, heated moments where emotion gets the best of us sometimes. we got Doug Null with us today. He is the author of the book, De-Escalate, How to Calm Any Situation or How to Calm an Angry Person in 90 Seconds or Less. And he's also a lawyer turned peacemaker. So, Doug, welcome to the program today. Hi, Hi Jamie. Great to be here. So, a lawyer turned peacemaker seems like a little bit of a contradiction. You got to explain that one for me. Well, first of all, I follow, I stand on the shoulders of the greats because both Abraham Lincoln and Mahatma Gandhi were both lawyers and both great peacemakers in their own ways. So a lawyer turned peacemaker is not as weird as people think it is. But uh, essentially, my journey was to be a trial lawyer for 22 years and then through a series of growth experiences I had, um, making the decision that uh, um, I could serve more people doing something other than being a trial lawyer. And so I went back to school and earned my master's degree in peacemaking and conflict studies, left the practice of law in 2000 when I was 50 years old and became a peacemaker. And uh, I've been doing that ever since. And I've had just some really incredible experiences. Now, specifically, Uh, you're working in mediation. Am I correct? Correct. I'm a professional mediator. I'm also a trainer and teacher and author. Uh, Currently, my my big project is Prison of Peace, which I co-founded with my colleague Laurel Coffer in 2009. And right now we're working in nine California prisons, training lifers and long-termers inmates how to be peacemakers and mediators in prison to quiet down prison violence. Wow, and, and I, was, I was reading about that, and that, that's a tremendous cause. We'll, we'll cover that, uh, too, in this discussion. So my, my first you know, question is, whenever you're involved in a, in a, in a, in a conflict, let, let's take us through the steps then. How, how do you advise people right. when they're in conflict? So when people get really escalated, they get very angry. Um, they're no longer capable of, uh, capable of rational thought. So if, if you're going to calm them down, you have to approach them quite differently than what we might suppose. The steps are very simple. Step number one is for the next 90 seconds, ignore the words. Doesn't matter what they're saying. It's just noise. There's nothing there that has any meaningful data at all. So just ignore it. Step number two is to guess at the emotions the speaker is having in the moment. And usually, of course, if it's anger. It'll be anger. But underneath anger are, are going to be a whole complex of other, other emotions that you might want to tap into. And then the third step, and this is where it's really counterintuitive, is to reflect back the emotional experience of the speaker using a very simple use statement. So I would say something like, Jamie, you're really frustrated now. You're really angry. You're pissed off. You feel disrespected. Nobody's listening to you, and you feel completely betrayed. So you acknowledge their their emotion. You validate their emotions. Acknowledge and validate. Very important that you don't use an I statement, and it's very important that you don't ask a question. So I wouldn't say, gee, Jamie, what I think you're feeling is anger, or gee, Jamie, are you angry? Mm-hmm. Those two don't work. Only the direct you statement works. And it's a, when you do this, it is incredibly powerful because the brain science now shows that when you do this, the emotional centers of the brain quiet down almost instantly and the prefrontal cortex comes back online so you can engage people in, in problem solving uh, in a matter of seconds. But what about the person who, when you get angry and you start yelling at them, they yell right back? Well, <laughs> I mean, of course, that's a how, does, how do you handle that? Just, let's just say I'm just, I'm just naturally going to snap myself. How do, how do you start with that? So, so you practice this skill in very safe, low-risk social environments until it becomes a part of you. And then when somebody get, gets angry, now if you, get, if you start it and you get angry at somebody else, it takes a lot of discipline for you to back off of your own anger and start to de-escalate another person. But if you if you can use these skills when somebody gets angry at you, you will not get escalated yourself. That's the whole reason why you ignore the words. If you listen to the words, you're gonna get pissed off. If you so, ignore the words, you won't, it won't bother you. And so you obviously have learned this technique uh, through, through countless mediation, through litigation. Right. I mean, you've been involved in conflict uh, your entire life. And I often ask, uh, you know, attorneys and mediators, how do you just handle just all that negativity and all that, you know, uh, uh, those intractable conflicts that, that arise from, from the work that you do? So when you, when you recognize that we're 98%, as human beings, we are 98% emotional and only 2% rational. And the small rationality we have is called bounded rationality. We're only rational under certain very limited circumstances. When you get that, then you start seeing people when they're upset and angry and frustrated, and you start realizing that they're just having an emotional experience. And it's no big deal. All I have to do is de-escalate them, calm them down, 
And I can do it very quickly, as can anybody else who follows these simple steps, and then we can engage in problem solving. So when now somebody might, becomes angry, what, what what's going on in the brain? You mentioned bringing them back in the prefrontal cortex takes right. over. So when somebody gets emotional, what, what's going on? So when people get emotional, um, uh, the, their brain, emotion, we could, it's a graduate school course on what emotion is and how we manage it. But very simply, when people become emotional, their brain is telling them there's something out there in the environment that they have to pay attention to right now. And if it's a really intense emotion, then that creates an urgency, which basically shuts down our problem solving uh, mechanisms in the brain. And, and really, we're being primed to take action, to either approach or to defend or to flee. So anger is a boundary violation. It's basically saying, don't step on me. Um, so there's something going on out there. And, the, and, and there are these parts of the brain that activate and dominate our whole being for the time that the emotion is triggered cannot distinguish between a social threat and a physical threat. So it could be a rattlesnake or it could be an insult. The brain's going to respond in exactly the same way. You know, I've always said that you know, decisions involve three components, a logical component, an emotional component, and then a faith-based component for, for the spiritual-minded people out there. And I okay. always advise people, take a step back, remove the emotion from the decision-making and apply the logic. How would you respond if I said that? I would say that's impossible for a human being to do. Every decision we make is emotional. There is not any decision we make that doesn't have a, a strong emotional component to it. You can't even make a decision without being emotional. How could you decide what to do unless you had an emotions telling you that you had choices? So, and this is, this I think is a flaw in Western culture and it goes all the way back to the Greeks and it's been carried forward through Platonism and then Neoplatonism and through uh, Augustine and then into the Enlightenment where we have given privilege to rationality. And, and we know commonsensically it doesn't work. Now, finally, people are beginning to realize that we are emotional, not rational. And this has given rise to the whole field of neuroeconomics and behavioral economics and the, and the, the understanding that, um, in, for example, in economic theory, utility theory, the utility function is flawed, deeply flawed. That's why Kahneman got the Nobel, because he figured out prospect theory and, and was able to mathematically explain the emotional decision making that goes on, especially in terms of risk. Um, and so I think we have to dispel this myth that we are rational beings and start recognizing that we are highly emotional. And yeah, we uh, I like this topic because I myself am, I'm a person who's calm in all situations. And when I feel angered, I, I, I always, re, I always want people to like and respect me. And I always want to behave in a professional manner, even when I'm anger, irritated at them. I, I, just, I get frustrated with people internally when they get emotional with me and I don't like to be emotional back. It, it's a, it's a part of human humanity that, that frustrates frustrates me. I wish we were more cordial with one another on all levels, even when we're upset with one another. Well, let's talk about what we're really talking about here is emotional intelligence. So it, it's one thing to be emotional, and it's another thing to be emotionally intelligent. People who are emotional without any discipline can be very difficult to be with. And that's why these de-escalation techniques are so powerful, because most people are not emotionally intelligent. Most people don't take the time to learn how to be emotionally intelligent, and so they just react. Whatever the environment stimulates in them, they just become reactive to it, and they become slaves to their programming. Um, when we can learn how to de-escalate people, that all changes. And as we learn to de-escalate, that makes us more emotionally intelligent, and so we tend not to get triggered ourselves. Um, so, so let's go back through those steps again to de-escalate a, a sure. situation. We talked Very about that at the simple. top, but let's go back through that again. Step number one, you're confronted with an emotional, angry person. Step number one is ignore the words. Right now, the words have no meaning for the next 90 seconds. Step, step number two. Guess at what their emotions are. Should be very obvious. And we are, as human beings, we're very good at picking up on the emotions of other people. Guess at them. You don't even have to be right. Just guess. Step number three, reflect back the emotion with a simple you statement. You are angry. You are pissed off. You are frustrated. You are anxious. You're scared. You're frightened. You're, you're sad. Whatever it might be. Reflect it back with a simple you statement and wait and watch. You're going to get, when you hit it, you're going to get four involuntary responses that are very obvious. The first thing you're going to get is a nodding of the head. The second thing you're going to get is a verbal response like, exactly, that's exactly how I feel. The third thing you're going to get is a dropping of the shoulders. And the fourth thing you're going to get is a deep sigh of relief. 
when and those are all unconscious involuntary responses when you when you see those you know you've successfully de-escalated somebody and they will immediately calm down it's a good topic i like to whenever i'm being yelled at i like to remain calm listen and then i'll be like are you done <laughs> <laughs> well you can do that but, but, it, but if you're being yelled at you can you're far more effective if you can get them calmed down because then you can move into problem solving mode a lot faster you can let them rant and, and go crazy but but they're not going to calm down and it's going to take them hours for their brain to get back to a place where they can do effective problem solving Instead, you can de-escalate them in literally 90 seconds and immediately engage in problem solving and not waste all that time waiting for their brain to, to restabilize. Now, you've written a book, De-escalate, How to Calm an Angry Person in 90 Seconds, uh, being released uh, this month. Uh, where can people pick this up and, and tell us a little bit more about what you go into in this book? So the book it was released last week. It's been published by Beyond Words and Simon and & Schuster. And basically, I take these skills that I've developed um, over the last 17 years and synthesize them in the arc of life, starting with, I take the first couple of chapters explaining why we don't pay attention to emotions and why they're important and give you all the science behind it. And then I start with uh, toddlers saying, how do you, how do you stop a screaming two-year-old? How do you stop a screaming two-year-old and stop that tantrum right now? And I take you all the way through the arc of life. And then I look at schools and the workplace and I finally end up with uh, looking at political polarization. How do we have a calm conversation with the politically polarized using these skills. So it's a, it's a very practical book for people who really want to learn the skills of how to deal with the angry upset that exists around them. Currently talking to uh, Doug Nolgan, author, mediator, and peacemaker. You can learn more at DougNoll.com. When we come back from the break, I want to talk with him a little bit more about the uh, Prison of Peace project that he mentioned there at the uh, top of this segment where he's using his uh, techniques to work with prison inmates in California. And they've worked with some 25,000 different inmates. So definitely want to hear from that. We'll hear from him on that when we come back from the break. On That Business Show 2.0 with your host, Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business. Welcome back to That Business Show 2.0 with Jamie Maloney, where business becomes a show business. So, Doug, you're also involved with the Prison of Peace uh, project where you're using these de-escalation uh, techniques with California prison inmates. How, first right. off, how did you get involved in the California penal system? The, um, well, interestingly, as a lawyer, I never had any, I was not a criminal lawyer, so I had no experience with either criminal law or working in the prison system. But what happened was that, that in 2009, my colleague, Laurel Coffer, who is a well-known mediator in Los Angeles, called me uh, and said, hey, I got a letter I want to read you. And so she read me this letter from a woman who was serving a life sentence without possibility of parole at what was then the largest, most violent women's prison in the world, uh, the Valley State Prison for Women in Chowchilla, California. And this woman, Susan Russo, was requesting uh, that we come in and train lifers and long-termers how to become peacemakers and mediators so that number one, they could reduce the violence in the prison themselves, and two, they could teach other inmates how to reduce violence. Well, we thought about it and said, you know, if this is for real, we should try. We should check this out and see if we can do it. And so it took us six months, but we finally got permission. And in April of 2010, we started training 15 women. All, this is all pro bono. We never expected to train more than 15 women and just get them started. But by the time we were done with that first training, there were hundreds of women who are begging us to train them too, because they saw the results that we were getting with our first students. So we stayed there for three years and we ultimately ended up training, uh, I don't know, 300, 400 peacemakers and mediators and ended up with a training cadre of, of 30, 30 trainers training at all the different levels of our curriculum. Then the, that prison was shut down and repurposed to a, a men's prison and the women were shipped out. And we told the women we'd, we'd follow them wherever they went. So there were two other women's prisons in California, one in the south and one right across the street from where they were. And we said, we'll just follow you and continue to support you. Well, after the women left, we started getting calls from the warden of the prison, who was now the warden of the men's prison, saying, will you please bring prison of peace back for the men? 
well, we'd never trained men and we didn't know whether men would be amenable to this or not. And we said, no, we're not getting paid. This is all pro bono. We're, we're all financially destitute because it's, this is really hurting us financially. But finally we said yes. So we spent the next three years working in a men's prison and we had exactly the same result that we had with the women. We trained over four or 500 men in peacemaking and mediation skills. We ended up with 30 trainers and um, it was amazing. Now, so in the California, the and correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the California prison system dominated by gangs? And I mean, yes, I mean it how is. do you overcome that gang is. politics? Well, it, yeah, sometimes you can't. Um, I was just going to say we, we got a huge grant from a series of grants from the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation to expand prison of peace into six more prisons. And in one prison in particular, we were going to be assigned to one yard that was a gang yard. And the gang leaders decided they didn't want prison of peace there. And so we couldn't go into the yard. But we went, every yard we've gone into on, in every prison, uh, we have always worked with gang members. And, and they, in fact, one of our most powerful mediators was the founder of the Aryan Brotherhood. Wow. And these people, are, these people are powerful, effective peacemakers. We're working at, at Corcoran State Prison right now in, in the DPU, the Gang Deprogramming Unit. It's a level four lockdown facility. We're 100 feet from Charles Manson's skill cells. We're working, we work with 15 guys at a time. They're all ex gangbangers, all have had extremely violent pasts. And they are turning out to be really powerful peacemakers. Um, it's amazing to watch how they go through, how they change as they learn the curriculum and they learn how to de escalate and they learn about problem solving and they learn about the choices they have when they're confronted with, with uh, arguments and fights and violence. Uh, it's just amazing to watch. I mean, it's, it's incredibly transformative. So is the mission of the project to get this into other prison systems and, and train other, other people like yourself, to, uh, these techniques? Because our, our, you know, I mean, our prison population is really, you know, it's, it's right. a violent environment in there. Well, yes, we would love to be able to do that. Right now, Prison of Peace is Laurel Coffer and Doug Knoll and our program director, Nicole Coleman. And we are, you know, just three of us with a very limited amount of funding. Ideally, what we would like to do is find funding to train our parolees who are coming out to allow them to become trainers in the prisons because they're far more credible than we are. We have about 600, roughly 600 of our people have been paroled, zero reports of recidivism or reoffending to date. And we have about we have about five or six of them who are really powerful trainers whom we'd love to be able to hire and expand into other prisons, both in California and elsewhere. <laughs> we have a project going in Greece right now. One of our colleagues, an Athens lawyer, came over and studied with us for six months and went back to Greece. She now has prison of peace going with a colleague of hers in, in three uh, prisons, and, a, and she's about to open prison of peace in six more prisons. So she's going gangbusters there. And we're having ongoing discussions with other states and, and, and a few foundations about the possibility of opening prison of peace in other states. It is very intensive work. It's very challenging work, and it's a little it's ex, it's expensive in the beginning, but it and it because it takes three years to embed a program into a prison completely where it's self-sustaining. So this is not something light and easy. It's something that's very difficult. Um, takes a lot of effort and challenge. Now the steps the steps that you have given us. What about in a threatening situation where you're you're the person is not only angry but they are physically threatening you? Maybe you're being attacked uh, with a knife or something. Do, can those well, can those same techniques we, we, help in, you in the, this situation? Yeah, in the prison environment, the first thing we tell our people is, you know, if you're if there's any threat of violence, get out of there, leave. You don't. There is no reason to subject yourself to violence. Um, and uh, w frankly, in all the years we've been doing this, we have never had a problem. Not even not even a iota of a problem. We the loyalty of our inmates is so intense they they die for us. Really, um, they would protect us if there was ever an issue. So we've never had any security problems. But you know, prisons have a lot of rules. We follow the rules. We take all the security precautions that we're told to take, and and it all works. Um, it, on the outside, if I say the same thing to people, if you are if you are being threatened with violence, um, get out of there. Don't, there's no point in trying to de-escalate somebody who is who wants to pull a knife or pull a gun on you. Just get the heck out of the way and and don't take don't be vulnerable. It's a little different for me. I'm a second degree black belt. I'm trained in this sort of thing, so it takes a lot to intimidate me. But 
things that I would take on are stuff that most people I would advise don't don't do this sort of thing. Now, do these skills work with uh, people of all makes and models, uh, children, adults? I mean, is it the same across uh, all generations too? It is out, the human brain responds to this de-escalation strategy exactly the same way. It's it's even cross-cultural, and obviously the way you describe the emotions is going to culturally vary. But the brain is hardwired to receive this information from a listener. And this is a beautiful way to stop a two-year-old from having a tantrum. And in fact, I argue, and I mention in the book, that, that the, the best way to raise a child is to use this de-escalation strategy frequently from 18 months to four years old, especially when the emotional centers of the brain, of the child's brain are developing by well, this process known as affect labeling the child's emotions, you're helping the child build a database, emotional categorization and granularization, which allows for the development of high emotional intelligence. The best thing you can do for your child, besides providing food and shelter, is to help him or her develop emotional competency. And the way we do that is by labeling their emotions in the moment as they come up. So this, this technique really centers around being a great listener, something that I think I do very well and something I think a lot of people uh, undervalue and, and, and don't practice the way they should. Be a great listener. Don't be so quick to keep jumping into the conversation. And, and, not only, and it's important to know what to listen for. When you're dealing with somebody who's highly escalated, you're, you're not listening for the words. You're listening to the emotions. You're reading the emotional data field and then reflecting that back. There are other times when you do listen to the words and you paraphrase a core message or even you even mirror back. I'm a pilot, and when I'm talking to air traffic controllers, um, I, I have to mirror back the, the clearance that I get so that we all understand the safety of the situation. So that's appropriate. Um, affect labeling to an air, air traffic controller is not a good thing. <laughs> There's no need for it. But if I'm dealing with somebody in a mediation, for example, who's highly escalated, very angry, very frustrated, being betrayed, then listening to their emotions is far more important than listening to their words. How does so this technique what, work with? How does this technique work with social media these days, where you're not talking, you're typing to people? Does, I, does this work this, uh, with that? It works beautifully. I like everybody else. I have a pretty, pretty pretty big social media presence. And every now and then I get really snarky comments on my YouTube channel or on posts and whatever. And all I do is label back what I think the emotions are. And I say, you're really frustrated. You're really angry. You feel disrespected. You feel like nobody's listening to you. Um, and I never hear from these people again. They go, <laughs> they go away. You de-escalated it, but you just don't get to see the benefit of it. They just, I guess they just go away then, yeah, right? It works. <laughs> it, I mean, obviously it works better if you're face to face. It works over the telephone. Right. It works to a limited degree in social media. If you just label, guess what the snarky person, the disrespectful person is thinking? Why would they say that? They're angry. They're frustrated. They're not being heard, whatever it might be. Label that back and then watch what happens. It's pretty amazing. It's, I mean, this is really powerful stuff. Well, again, Doug Noll, author of the uh, book, How to uh, De-Escalate, How to Calm an Angry Person in 90 Seconds or Less. Where can people pick that up? Is it available on your site, Amazon? Where's it, the availability? You can, it's available everywhere. I have a, a benefactor who has put up some money so that if you're willing to pay the shipping and handling for seven bucks, we'll, we'll buy the book for you. And if you want to get that offer, you can go to dougnoll.com and just click on the banner and it'll take you to the page where you can put in your book order. Also, uh, prison. Otherwise, it's available in all the usual places. Also, the Prison of Peace project that we uh, talked about, you can learn more about that at prisonofpeace.org. Right, exactly. Prisonpeace.org. Right. Doug, any closing thoughts to leave our audience with? Great discussion today. I definitely want to pick up a copy of the book of myself, but what would you like to leave the audience with today? I, I, want, I, I just think it's important that people recognize that as we learn more about how our brains work, we're learning more and more about the importance of emotions. And our Western culture has uh, not privileged emotions very much. In fact, we've diminished the importance of emotions. And I think the moment we start figuring out that emotions are the most important part of what drives everything we do in our life, every decision we make, and we start learning how to manage that emotional complexity that we experience every day, the happier and more graceful our lives are going to be. Good discussion, Doug Knoll, author, mediator, and peacemaker. Thank you so much for being with me on the program today. Hey, it's been a great conversation. Thank you, Jamie. Absolutely. And again, DougKnoll.com and also PrisonOfPeace.org for more, more information. New episodes of our program air weekday mornings, 9 a.m. on ThatBusinessNetwork.com. And please connect with us all across social media, Facebook.com forward slash ThatBusinessShow. Twitter is at ThatBizShow. And to come on to the program, learn more at TBSInterview.com. You've been listening to That Business Show 2.0 with Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business.